All righty. Welcome back, everyone, for <laughs> best summit ever. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, the the uh, the panelists so far have been blow me out of the water, amazing and fun. So forget making dinner tonight. This is more important. <laughs> Glad to hear it. I have Hugh in the kitchen. He's been working hard, so <laughs> I will get dinner. Uh, so uh, this is our add-on that was supposed to be last night, but we got a, a fun surprise last night instead, which worked out really well, so not an issue. Uh, so this is Dr. Holly Gans, and she is the uh, founder of Animal Biome, and I met her in Texas a few years ago when we were at a an event for sort of new up and coming companies. And I was invited to come because that was the year that I won the woman of the year in the pet industry. So it was kind of fun. And we got to meet lots of um, entrepreneurs with great ideas. And Holly had this great idea about looking at the digestive tract of animals and um, figuring out how to, improve on what's going on in there or not going on in there as the case may be. Um, so she's going to give us some information about chronic digestive disorders in pets. And this is a biggie. I, the, the two big things that I get questions about and consultations are digestive disorders and allergies. And as many of us have now learned, allergies are commonly secondary to digestive disorders. <laughs> because if that microbiome is not in good shape, everything else falls apart, including our brain and everything else. So Holly, I am going to make you the host so that you, there you go, you will be able to share your screen. And um, Holly said that she will, uh, oh, just got Tank's biome done and successfully changed his diet. That was one of my consultations. Um, and you feel bad for your dog. She has tummy troubles at least once a week. Well, hopefully we can help out here. Um, so, and she said that feel free to put questions in the chat. And if we see them and can grab them before they go by, uh, we'll try to interact with you as we go. So Holly, the stage is yours. All right. Thank you. Well, it's nice to meet everybody. <laughs> and I'm um, sorry for yesterday. I got I put it on the calendar for the wrong day. So I appreciate yeah. you sticking with me. <laughs> the, the last talk of the event. Um, I'm going to share some slides. And I think I'm going to be looking at my slides on the left screen and like your questions on the right screen. So if I'm looking away, it's I'm not. I am paying She's attention. She's not ignoring us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just going to help me keep track of the questions, but maybe Judy, if you if you can, also help. Yeah. Remind me if there's something. Yeah. I'm going to share some slides, and just let me know if you can see them. And actually, now that I've done that, I cannot see the questions. Okay. Let's go back here. Yeah. All right. Um, Hopefully, the chat will show up for me. So. Sorry, I did the wrong button to present. There we go. So yeah, so I can't see the question. So you'll just have to let me know. So okay. today I'm gonna talk about chronic digestive disorders in pets. And I may be diving in a little deep, but I know this is a motivated group who's sat through all these lectures. And, um, and so I wanted to- So your slides you know, aren't showing up. What we're seeing- It's not? Okay. What we're seeing right. is something that says, share with people in groups, get a link. You've got something okay. showing up in front of your slides. All right, let me um, go back to Zoom and- Sorry. Oh yeah, resume share. I think I'm- There we go. <laughs> okay. So let's see if I hit present, if that works or not. It's loading. Hey, yay. <laughs> okay. Okay. And now I, now I can figure, I figure out how to get the chat to show to you, but still I could use your help because I, once I get going, I might not pay attention. Okay. Now that we got the technology set. <laughs> so what is, what is the microbiome? So usually, um, when we talk about the gut microbiome, often we're really referring to the fecal microbiome. Um, we care about what's going on in the gut, but it can be hard to get samples unless you do, you know, endoscopy or other like procedures that really require a veterinarian. Um, otherwise, we rely a lot on learning about, you know, what we can from poop. It's non-invasive. It's produced regularly, hopefully, and um, and there's a lot that it can tell us about about gut health. So. 
the microbiome is a term of art that scientists use, and it actually um, comes from from sort of people who studied plant disease originally coined it, and um, and it's basically a community of microorganisms that live in and on both plants as well as animals, and even the soil has a microbiome, and it includes all kinds of microbes, so bacteria, and then there's other similar groups of groups that's similar to bacteria, but that's been recently um, recognized as being different, which are archaea. There's also fungi, they're really important. Um, protists or protozoa, which includes algae. And then of course there's viruses. A lot of the viruses are viruses that actually attack bacteria. So typically in the microbiome. So all of bacteria tend to have their own viruses and there's like little warfare going on inside, inside of all of us. And that's, I mean, we're lucky also fungi are involved in that and that's how we got antibiotics so we're, you know that's something we've been able to take advantage of um, as a species in our medicine so um, the gut microbiome plays important roles in health as as dr morgan already um, mentioned so it's and the most obvious um, is that it um, this community can play important roles in the digestion of food but it also they produce vitamins and neurotransmitters they're involved in bile acid production and the, the microbiome also helps to regulate metabolism and can contribute to um, disorders, it, metabolic disorders that, that can lead to things like obesity. Also, the opposite can happen where you, you don't keep the weight on appropriately. Um, it's been linked to abnormal cell growth and contributing to some cancers. Having a healthy biofilm in, in your gut, also in your mouth, can help that um, to protect the body against invasion by pathogens. Of course, there's a connection between the gut and the brain and that can influence our behavior. Um, there's also a gut skin axis. There's, they, they're not talking about like a gut liver axis or sort of like the more we look, the more we realize that the gut is, is just very foundational. And, and a big part of that is because more than half of, of the immune system um, cells are in the gut. And so, and of course, um, and that's linked in with uh, inflammation and sort of inflammation can be an appropriate response, but it can also become problematic. So the big thing that influences the gut microbiome is really is really diet. I mean, of course, I usually like to start by talking about how we, you know, when we're born, we used to think that, you know, like the uterus was sterile and we were born with nothing. But now we know that there are some microbes that they're actually in, in the uterus. And, um, and when, um, when the body is preparing to, when a, a mother's body is preparing to give birth, actually like they found with humans that certain bacteria actually come to colonize the birth canal and help to colonize the, the newborn with, with beneficial bacteria. Um, but after sort of birth and nursing and, and the, the, the baby um, gets exposed to those early life ex experiences, diet ends up being a very, very critical factor. And um, it's something, of course, that we can also manipulate, right? We can control what we eat and what we feed our pets and have um, and push the microbiome in certain directions that can be more beneficial. Likewise, though, if you're, if you're feeding a diet that's, you know, poor quality or has like a lot of carbohydrates, for example, with some of the commercial diets that his historically have been around, I think that some, you know, cheaper foods tended to use, you know, ingredients that were more affordable and, um, and may not have supported the, the right diversity in the gut. Um, also, we talk a lot about like the Western diet for ourselves, like that maybe we tend to like eating too many carbohydrates ourselves. And that can also make our microbiome more depleted compared to you know, people living a, a more traditional lifestyle. So and other things that are really common, both for people and pets is the use of like, um, heartburn medications, like the proton pump inhibitors and NSAIDs, you know, for pain relievers, these can actually cause um, significant effects to the microbiome. And these are unintended, right? That's not what the manufacturers had in mind, but the more we look, the more we've, we've found that medications have unintended effects. And so they, they are important tools, but it might be that you need to um, pay extra attention to the diet and add some fiber or other other or more protein, depending on the the individual, to help support diversity. And um, likewise, as we age, our microbiome also tends to to decline. Although um, 
not everybody. So it's, you know, there's a lot of individual variation, but in general, there's a big effect of age. And the most obvious thing, of course, is that antibiotics are given to knock back pathogens. And of course, they have significant effects on beneficial gut bacteria in many cases as well. And um, up until recently, people weren't really looking at that. And part of that was because we didn't really have the genetic tools to do this until you know, about, about 10 years ago to do it in a very affordable way. So, sorry, I'm going backwards. <laughs> I went the wrong direction. Okay, so I started studying the dog and cat microbiomes about nine years ago. Um, and, and now since starting the company about four years, four and a half years ago, I've sequenced, I've looked at I think we're going on 10,000 different um, samples from dogs and cats. And we also have some side things going with ferrets, but I won't talk about that today, but they are pets. And they actually, they get, they get IBD and GI lymphoma, just like cats and dogs. In fact, they're considered sort of a model system for researchers. Um, so just like us, 20% um, of cats and dogs tend to get these chronic GI conditions. And um, when we look at what might be underlying them we find we've sort of identified three very common types of microbiome problems and the first like one that's sort of the, the the first thing that your vet will think of is like are is there a pathogen that's overrepresented or like has has taken advantage of a depleted um, ecosystem and is, is going crazy sort of like the the c diff like in humans where it's a normal member of the microbiome, but when the microbiome becomes depleted after like a lot of antibiotic exposure, it can become a problem. And, and now there are antibiotic resistant strains out there that you can acquire in the hospital. And so that's an example of a group that really tends to become overgrown. Um, and it, while it's more common in people, it also does happen, um, especially more in dogs than cats. Another example is, is E. coli which can cause like, uh, it's a food safety organism and it can cause terrible diarrhea in people. Um, we actually find it's a big problem in dogs. I think 30% of the people who um, do microbiome testing with us for a chronic GI problem, their dog will have elevated levels of E. coli. E. coli is also like a normal member of the gut flora, but, um, but it shouldn't be taking over and it does. Um, other, other problems we've identified is that key groups that are beneficial can be missing. And we think that might be because either they just didn't get the right thing for mom to begin with, which can happen, or more likely they've, they've, they've had antibiotic exposure or other, um, or they got Giardia or had an infection, which really knocked back the diversity and they weren't able to get re recolonized with all of the, the key beneficial microbes. And then um, sometimes there's, a, a good diversity of different kinds of bacteria in the microbiome, but it's just not in the right balance. And so there's like some groups like Fusobacterium is a group that is really important in cats and dogs and not so important in people. Um, it, it responds well to protein. And, and if you have a diet that doesn't have the right ratio of macronutrients and doesn't have enough protein, then often this group isn't, isn't in the right, right range. But if you have too much protein and not enough fiber in the diet, and this can be like individually variable, then it can go, it can sort of be too much of a good thing. And we tend to think of this as the Goldilocks group that so needs to be sort of in the just in the right amount. And if it's, if it's underrepresented, then it's correlated with IBD. But if it's overrepresented, it can also cause GI distress and diarrhea. So it's, uh, it needs to be there, but just in the right amount. And so, how these manifest, um, Dr. Morgan's already mentioned this, but the most common is probably food sensitivities. We, or the, you know, we think of them as allergies, but they may or may not be a true allergy. Um, one, sometimes we know that they weren't after the fact if we find that like a diet change actually, um, or, or a fecal transplant or another approach resolves it and then the food sensitivities disappear. Um, but also very common manifestations are chronic diarrhea, constipation, or vomiting, also sort of inappropriate weight loss or weight gain. 
and then of course like itchy skin is is very common as well and it's kind of counterintuitive that there's this connection between the, the gut and, and our skin and our pet skin so a problem that sort of was what led me to to start a company and to leave my academic research was that in in veterinary medicine and in human medicine too a lot of the current solutions have t historically ignored the microbiome that's not that's less of the case in like holistic veterinary medicine but for um, more conventional practitioners they tend to ignore this and to rely a lot on things like antibiotics um, these are you know, antibiotics are a critical tool um, but they can reduce both the harmful and beneficial microbes at the same time. And things like metronidazole, which is commonly used, and I certainly used it for my dog who had problems where I could, I had basically like a standing prescription, could get it whenever I wanted to. And it did resolve, like she had bloody diarrhea, it was life-threatening, so it was a useful tool, but, um, but it, she did end up with elevated levels of Escherichia because metronidazole does not knock back Escherichia. So it can sort of introduce other problems. Another common solution are probiotics. And there are some probiotics like, like Saccharomyces boulardii, which do seem to be um, able to be used and, and help resolve diarrhea and don't harm beneficial native gut microbes. But um, you know, more and more, right, they're putting probiotics in food and so it's sort of becoming everywhere and we don't really know at this point like what's the right amount of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria to put into food um, and then also because microbiome testing isn't part of standard vet um, practice and the vet diagnostics um, there hasn't been understanding of what well what is the current state of the microbiome and, and how can we approach rebalancing it and that's something that so I basically took a academic tool where like, we're doing genetic sequencing of a marker gene for bacteria. And then by doing all these thousands of samples from cats and dogs, developed an understanding of what is healthy. Because certainly that's a big debate is, is there such a thing as a core healthy microbiome for people or for our pets? And at this point, I, I can confidently say that there there is a core healthy microbiome. While there's a lot of variation among us, um, there are core groups that, that are found in the vast majority of healthy individuals. And so they can provide us with a, a guide, some guideposts for what, what the microbiome should look like. And then when you look at, of course, sick pets, it's very obvious that, 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 it, that they're not healthy. Um, so what are, what are some more innovative approaches to try and solve imbalances in the microbiome, these kinds of problems? So first you do want to reduce harmful microbes and that's like they do with antibiotics, but there are other ways of doing that. Um, like bacteriophage cocktails have been developed for E. coli. They don't address every strain, but they can be a great place to start because they're not going to harm the other, anything else. They're only going to go after specific E. coli strains. Um, and I think we'll look for more and more of these kinds of, um, approaches that are very targeted for the harmful microbes. Um, also, you want to help maintain the good stuff, good microbes. At this point, the best way for us to reintroduce the key beneficial bacteria is something called fecal microbiota transplantation, or FMT. Um, and it can be done as part of microbiome restorative therapies. And it's, it's, I imagine people have heard of it here, but it, it sounds gross, but it's been actually practiced in Chinese medicine for more than a thousand years. And in veterinary medicine, it's been used, especially in livestock for several hundred years. And um, in, and with, com with companion animals, it's probably more in the last, I don't know, 20 years or so. But you can imagine that if you have like a cow or a sheep and they aren't and they don't have the microbes that they need to digest that plant material which is really hard to digest um, it's a problem and so that's um, the people who care for livestock are a bit ahead of us on that <laughs> of course you can also modify diet and supplements and this is great right like we can we can help to shape things by by diet and so that's a great opportunity for us to to help support health on a daily basis
And then of course, um, I believe that it's really helpful to base these decisions on testing and understanding of what, what a healthy microbiome should look like. So that's sort of the approach that we've developed is to assess, use genetic sequencing to look at all the bacteria, then restore, you know, especially in, um, with your veterinarian's advice, or um, you know, if you want to work on your own, but we definitely recommend as much as possible, like involving your veterinarian. They can they can add additional tools to help restore the the balance to the community, and then and then preventative care, of course, is really critical. And supporting wellness before you are into a crisis state is always a good idea, but you know it's always hard. Life is busy, so but you can maintain with repeated testing or giving supplements to help push things in the right way. And of course, the, the healthy diets. So I just have a few examples to sort of illustrate these ideas. So this, um, this is a dog, um, it's actually my dog, and she had had um, hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, which meant that she had bloody diarrhea. Um, it was very scary. It's something that she had always had a cast iron stomach. It's something that she developed later in life. I think she was 13 or 14 when she developed this problem. I now think it was probably an early warning sign for the pancreatic cancer that she ultimately ended up getting diagnosed with. But, um, but you know, there weren't there weren't really tests for that. It, like I did all the senior panels, and she was my baby. But um, we we were, we were only were able to find it sort of late. But um, so I gave her at this point uh, metronidazole, I think, for a couple of weeks because she was just having a lot of problems. And this is what her microbiome looked like afterwards. So the 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 stack, the figure on the left with the blues is is an, a representation of what um, kinds of bacteria we find in a healthy dog. So like Fusobacterium should be sort of around 19%. Um, anyway, you don't need to worry about the names, but what Yuki ended up having after having a prolonged exposure to this antibiotic was, especially I think this Escherichia being elevated is, is a mark of metronidazole um, used because it just isn't harmed by that antibiotic. But we also had Ruminococcus elevated, which is I think a sign of upper GI issues, Enterococcus. Anyway, we could start to see that like the microbiome in her case was very useful and not something that at that point was something that you could get from your veterinarian. Oh, sorry, I'm going to go backwards. Um, so there was an article that came out la about a year ago where they were looking at um, using fecal transplants as, as an alternative to treating acute diarrhea um, an alternate as opposed to using metronidazole. So there's the veterinary community is starting to recognize that there might be alternative approaches. And they found that actually a uh, um, fecal um, transplant was as effective as metronidazole. And in the long term, it may actually um, lead to a less of a relapse rate. So another thing just to think about is I know um, we probably most of us give probiotics to our pets and I think they are, I'm not against them. I think it's a useful tool, but we're still learning like how much should we give? Like should, should we be giving billions of CFUs every day? We, I, we don't really know. Um, and one concern that, um, that I think has been developing is that it can potentially compete with the native gut microbes. And there was a study that came out a couple years ago where they actually found that if giving probiotics after antibiotic exposure actually delayed the recovery of the native gut flora compared to doing a fecal transplant, which you know is not surprising, but it was the first study that, that actually really looked at that. And they also compared, the probiotics also delayed it just compared to spontaneous recovery or like, so, so there was three things. So they looked at probiotics and then doing FMT or just letting them recover on their own. And so the probiotics actually delayed it compared to even just recovery on your own. This is in humans, but we often at this point are using humans as a model system for understanding our pets as well. 
so I had um, four cases that I mentioned, and I think I have time to go through them, but please feel free to ask me any questions. Yeah, there's there's been a ton, um, and they're oh, kind of all shoot. over the place, but we can uh, scroll back through them. Let's, so, let's pause uh, there, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know if you want to pause and um, we can bring them up and go back uh, way up here. Okay, I mean, a lot of them are going to be really uh, case specific and we're not going to be able to give um, clear answers to them. Um, so, doo -doo 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 -doo. I just scroll down to where the actual questions start because everybody was chit chatting at the beginning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, your supplements helped so much. Went from five liquid poops to two to three normal poops a day. That's awesome. Um, somebody had a test done on their Doberman, has moderate to severe dysbiosis. Uh, just sent your, my yearly sample. I feel animal biome saved my dog's life. She still has many, many issues, but so much healthier already. Uh, just got the results back. My dog's biome is severely out of balance. What's next? Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't always give us all the answers, but it's a useful tool, right? I mean, these are complicated systems, complicated problems to solve. So we're just trying to offer an extra thing and it's, it's, really so rewarding when it does just solve that problem. Like it did for my dog with the hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. Like she, we did the, um, when I, she was the first dog to take our oral capsules for FMT and she didn't have any more bloody diarrhea. I mean, she ended up of course getting cancer, but, she, but we didn't have to worry about, you know, her having a life threatening um, situation for the rest of her life. So, so this dog who, who she got the results back that with it out of balance, the next step would be to do the, the FMT, the, the capsules, the gut restore. Um, and then I've, I've seen your reports, the reports, if you read them, it'll say, well, for this bacteria that's out of balance, we recommend adding more protein or this one, we recommend adding more fiber. Um, and I know that one of the questions in here was um, what fiber source do you recommend if they need more fiber? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely always looking for new um, new options. I mean, we ended end up relying a lot on inulin as like coming from like Jerusalem artichoke, it's a really good source, um, but there are many different plant sources for good fibers. Um, that's just our current current go to because it's easy easily um, obtained. Okay. Do you uh, have any that you recommend, Dr. Morgan? Uh, well, reading through your things, some some of the recommendations in one of the reports we got was uh, the resilium for one. There was mm -hmm. inulin for um, another. Um, I mean, sometimes I just try adding uh, more fibrous vegetable matter mm -hmm. in the diet, just depending on what they're eating. Uh, you know, sometimes we have these animals that are on a prey model raw and they're not getting any vegetable matter. And so it's like, well, it looks like your, your dog would really like to have some. So <laughs> you know, we'll, exactly. Yeah, so we see I, that know, too. Yeah. So sometimes it's just a matter of, um, you know, maybe your dog, your animal's gut isn't quite so happy on prey model. And we just, because if you looked at a true prey model in the wild, they're eating the hair, which is a good fiber source. And uh, most prey model diets are not including that in them. So, um, okay, yeah. here's another question. Dog throws up bile in the morning, has morning gurgling, added a third meal before bed and giving a half Pepsid before bed, but they don't like giving Pepsid daily. Well, wasn't Pepsid one of the things on your list of things that throws the biome out of whack? It is, but you know, sometimes it's like, what are you gonna do, right? I mean, so you gotta use it. But it's true, like long-term use is problematic. So if we have an animal, I, I mean, to me, it's pretty clear if you got an animal that's shooting diarrhea, their, their biome is out of whack and they probably would do well with uh, getting a fecal transplant. Do we see um, animals without diarrhea, but with upper GI problems where it's a biome problem as well? Yeah, so I think it's probably more, you know, in the small intestine, but yeah, they can have, um, or some, so it can be the stomach, right? It can be in different parts, but yeah, you sh that is a common, it's, I don't know what percentage, but it's, you know, 
maybe almost half of them are upper GI versus lower. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I mean, from a Chinese medicine perspective, I would have some other things that I might consider uh, herbal wise for something like that, but that's a different conversation. So we're not going to, we're not going to go in there. Um, this person says if she feeds her dog anything after 9 PM, she has to go out and vomit an hour or two later. Wow. it's interesting. Is that kind of the, um, the, that's kind of the same thing as that night regurge. And I get a lot of night regurge, uh, cases. Um, so feeding that extra meal, uh, having something in the stomach, my favorite go-to at bedtime is something with ginger in it. Ginger is very good for the stomach. So, um, a lot of people make my ginger cookie recipe and they'll give ginger cookies at bedtime. You can add a little bit of ginger tea to that meal. Uh, but ginger, um, in my hands works, uh, better than pepsin. <laughs> it's, I'm a huge fan of ginger. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, so this person has a dog that's on a, a, a gently cooked meal, protein, veggies, some pumpkin or sweet potato, has kidney disease and high blood pressure and developed pancreatitis. And unfortunately, pancreatitis goes along with kidney disease very commonly. So, you know, there's, it's, it's not the food that's causing it. It's the overall inflammation. Pancreatitis uh, is not well understood by most people. Everyone wants to correlate it to a high fat diet, but fat is, is only a small part of what goes into pancreatitis. Um, so that's, I mean, a microbiome transplant might help with that, but um, it's more a function of the kidney disease, I think. Okay. That's this right. person says, uh, just started on your gut restore 30 day supplement. Is it normal for him to seem really lethargic and get stomach aches, uh, right after starting it? Did they have a, did they have a transition period? This, this can happen. Um, yeah. So it's, it's been reported before. I mean, and so I definitely, you know, think sometimes slow is better and just, you can even do like one a week. I mean, like, or one every few days just to, the, there does seem to be a real response in some animals and um, to some, like it's like right away, it, it helps, but it's, you know, it's variable and that does happen. And I hate to have them, them suffer. I mean, another thing you can consider is doing like a in-clinic transfer as well. That might be something that could be more tolerated, but if, you know, I think being able to augment with the capsules at home is, is convenient. And I think we had one cat where that she did like, I think she might even start with one a month. Her cat was just so sensitive, but she was able to ultimately get her up to one a day. It just, we just had to go really slowly. Wow. Okay. Um, somebody has a three pound dog that will hardly eat and always has diarrhea. That's a, I can tell you that microbiome is out of whack and yes. you probably have food sensitivity, food intolerance, and you're going to need to go to novel proteins and really get away from what you've been doing. And I would say we're going to need probably a gently cooked, uh, real food diet for that. <clears throat> um, yeah, definitely start with the diet, right? That's because if you, you can do a fecal transplant, but if the diet isn't right, then it's not going to support yeah. the right. If your dog has a chicken intolerance and you keep feeding chicken, I don't care how many times you change the microbiome over. Um, yeah. This dog's resource guarding and frustration aggression really comes out when he has diarrhea. That is the liver overacting on the digestive system from a Chinese medicine standpoint. There's an herb called free and easy wanderer. <laughs> wow. Frustration means uh, liver cheese stagnation. Um, your microbiome may be out of whack too from the diarrhea, but um, <laughs> sorry, I have to throw that in there. Um, oh yeah. Okay. Does using pancreatic enzymes affect the biome in a pancreatitis dog? Actually, I mean, this is, I, I would actually probably refer to you, Dr. Morgan. I think that, um, Yes, I think that liver enzymes probably can affect the microbiome, no, but I think pancreatic that, using pancreatic enzymes as a supplement. Right, right. Sorry. Um, yes, but it, it sort of depends on if they're needed, then they can help to support the microbiome because they need, the microbiome is interacting with the pancreatic enzymes that are naturally produced normally. And so if they're absent, I think it can help to restore function. Okay. But it's controversial, right? I think in the published literature. Okay. 
Uh, when we say gut, say gut, are we talking stomach and intestines or all just, just all the insides? I, we're talking the digestive system. So basically the stomach, the intestines, the, you know, small and large intestines. So, um, so we've got a lot of dogs in here that people have uh, reflux issues. Um, home cooking is helping, but tons of reflux. And I, 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 I think we kind of already said that if they're getting reflux, they probably have a microbiome that's that's out of whack. Um, so it would be worth doing the animal biome test and see how out of whack it is, because that may tell you that you know your home cooking is helping because you got rid of the regurgitation. That's awesome, but you're still getting reflux there. So that means that there's still something that isn't quite right. And the, the testing the biome could give you information like mm, your dog might need more protein in that diet you're cooking, or your dog might need more fiber in that diet that you're cooking. So it just, it kind of helps to fine tune the diets as well. Um, so this is a dog that gets borborygamous every three weeks. Recently, it's every six days on home cooked, occasionally gets, uh, no diarrhea, but jelly-like attachment. Well, that's mucus, that's inflammation. So you still got inflammation going on there, but she's on gut sense and Dr. Dobias's vitamins. Something else is out of balance. Yeah, so I think that, I don't know, Dr. Tobias vitamins, and we recommend Dr. Tobias's prebiotic, which has the pre four pro bacteriophage cocktail. So it probably, I don't know if the vitamins have other things in them. But my guess is that then it's, if there is an E. coli issue, which there might be, um, it's not the right, like we might have to look at other ways to try and knock that down. Um, Cause pre four pro doesn't work against all E. coli, unfortunately. So um, if this animal is on gut sense, would, uh, would you recommend retesting the biome to see where things are? Since this is, has kind of upped its game to every six days we're getting this issue. Yeah, yeah, I would recommend that. Okay. All right. 11 year old seems to be getting chronic colitis infections, no lifestyle change, switch from raw to gently cook. All labs are normal. Done the leaky gut protocol with them with no change. Uh, chronic colitis. So have you um, tested that microbiome? I, I would be testing that microbiome for sure. Um, you know, not having parasites on a fecal sample is one small piece of the puzzle. So I'd probably check that microbiome and see, because again, it's an older animal and the microbiome changes as, as we age. So, uh, da -dun 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 -dun. Do -do -do -do. <laughs> why do dogs eat cat poop? I think they just like it. <laughs> yeah, there's all these different theories, but we don't, there's no real, we don't know the answer. My answer is, it is it's like candy for them. They love it. <laughs> I know we call we call it Tootsie Rolls with like exactly. Boy. It's candy. They <laughs> love it. Um, all right, nine and a half year old, hundred and five pound girl, reflux, gagging, licking, oh. gulping, plain miserable. Oh. Tried everything. Yeah, I would test her microbiome and see what's going on there. Um, all right, so Cavapoo began transferring from kibble. We're never gonna get through all these. Uh, transferring from kibble to raw, had about a vomiting. The diagnosis was an overload of bacteria with an antibiotic prescribed. And it was on answers raw, which is a, you know, high bacteria, but good bacteria. Um, That's right. Told to stop the raw. And now five months, at five months, we're still eating Hills ID kibble, which by the way, is not meant to be fed to puppies long-term. So I would, not recommend continuing that long term. Trying to go back to raw or even cooked and off kibble, what can I do to not mess them up further? I'd probably go to gently cooked to start yeah. before jumping yeah. into the raw um, and might want to consider testing his biome and see, you know, how far out of whack it is. Again, that will help you tailor the diet as far as how much protein and how much fiber you need to have in there. Yeah, let's just figure out if it's one, which one of those three problems they might have to, they, are they missing microbes? Do they have a pathogen? So now we've got another one. And this I see way too commonly animal with Giardia and they get multiple, 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 multiple rounds of metronidazole. The dog was also on oral flea and tick, um, got, which led to more vomiting and diarrhea, more metronidazole, <laughs> this poor thing. 
Um, how many weeks or months um, after a repair is the gut microbiome test recommended? So uh, it seems a depletion of good gut bacteria post antibiotics is extremely severe. After the last cycle, I guess of metronidal, she's giving a broad range of probiotics, including soil based, and is currently stable. So, how long? after all that disaster, would you recommend that she tests? And that brings up another good question. Do they have to be off probiotics when the sample is taken? Um, yeah, they should be. I mean, if they, I would, I, um, yeah, they need to be off them, you know, at least for a washout period. So we're not just measuring the probiotic and the fecal sample. But, you know, because now sort of there's growing research showing that probiotics can inhibit the native, like the recolonization of the native microbes. I try and wean um, her off that probiotic if you can, if she can still maintain being stable and then test. But if you can't, then just try and go a day or two and collect a sample. Okay. All right. Do, 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 do. All right. All right, so we've got a Pomeranian diagnosed with a stomach ulcer, got very sick very quickly, famotidine antibiotic bland diet, fine for three weeks, then blood in the stool again, back on antibiotic famotidine, propectolin. What can I feed him besides chicken and rice? And will this always be an issue for him? Well, first of all, I'd stop using chicken. Um, it's a hot hot energetically protein for those of you who know what I'm talking about with food energetics. Um, I really like turkey and pumpkin instead of chicken and rice for, for my kids that have uh, upset tummies um, that very reluctant to suggest a food. Uh, I would be looking for a gently cooked commercial diet for this little one. Um, and you've done the raw fermented goat's milk, but not currently because I don't want to upset his tummy that actually should soothe his tummy. Um, so I would look for one of the gently cooked diets. There's uh, many of them on the market these days. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'd also look at what that guy's microbiome is doing because there's been a lot of antibiotic use, the, um, the antacid use. Uh, so, and that one might be a really good one for a transplant as well. Um, yeah, I agree. All right, so that's a repeat. Feed gently cooked low fat beef and lamb, adding aloe vera juice and CBD. Okay. Uh, so we've got a dog with Escherichia shigella, high, no diarrhea, but horrible skin problems. Mm. Makes sense. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, so it's, it's definitely an indication of an imbalanced microbiome. And one way to knock it back is, the FMT also though, these, the pre four pro probiotic in combination, I, I think, especially with S. Boulardii can, can help to help with the skin as well as to knock back the E. Coli. Okay. Um, all right. Can vaccines mess up the microbiome? You know, I really don't think there's been definitive research on this. I may have changed um, recently, but um, we actually asked one of the big manufact vaccine manufacturers about that and they shut us down. So I think that there are, um, you know, medical schools starting to look at this, but I don't think we have a good answer yet. So it's a good question. So what we would have to do is test the microbiome on a dog or cat, whatever, and then give them their usual slew of vaccines and then go back and look at their microbiome a month later. And yeah, look, no, we should do it. We could do it. Look, it's not look that at hard. a couple thousand animals and see what we get. Yeah. Um, how long does the FMT supplement need to be given, and how long does it last? It lasts for about a year, um, at least the you know the our freeze dried approach. Um, and how long it needs to be given is variable. If they're a young animal, or if you're just trying to have them like if you want to do it preventatively after metronidazole exposure, you can do it for two weeks. I think that's sufficient. Um, there's a rule of thumb that some people offer, which is like, if they've been having these problems for months, it's sort of like you need, it's going to take as many months to restore it through diet and FMT as, as they've suffered. So it depends. Okay. 
yeah, I mean, if you've had a dog that's had um, diarrhea for two years, don't expect it to clear up on day one. Although sometimes with a sometimes complete, it does. complete diet change, sometimes it happens. And then I'm very happy because it makes me look good. <laughs> uh, so this person says the S. Boulardi in weakened immune systems, can it turn to systemic sepsis like it has in humans? Um, actually, we ha- I did write an article on this for at least we're on our um, blog. Um, there's one study in humans that it, it turns out that, that there's hundreds of papers since then showing that it does not does not actually cause that problem. So I wouldn't, yeah, I've, we've talked to many doctors and veterinarians now about this. And so it's not, it's initially, I was super conservative about it like four years ago, but okay. it doesn't seem to happen. All right. Uh, good. A lot of these, there's a million messages and a lot of them are people chatting with each other. Thank God. Cause we would never get through them. Um, when we do a test, do we also get an explanation of results? You do. And, uh, they're nice. They're, they're good. Um, yeah, we do a, a 15 minute consult. Just need to reach out and we'll schedule it. We don't, you know, broadcast it to everybody cause we would not have time for everybody, but you know, we do want to do it upon request. Okay. Um, so somebody says, should we not give probiotics with meals? I don't think you need to do probiotics regularly unless you have a problem. And so it's a way, I mean, I think you can save money. It's like, you know, it's sort of like taking a vitamin when you don't have a deficiency. Yeah. I, I have to say my dogs, um, don't always get probiotics. If the, you know, if their poop's normal and they're eating great and everything looks fine, then I don't. Um, if we're, if, if we run into a, a little hump in the road or, um, something changes when I have to add another medication or something, then sometimes I'll throw them back on. Um, so it's kind of variable. Um, mm-hmm. and they get, they get the fermented goat milk, not all the time, sometimes. So I think coming in fermented food is, is different. Like that can happen every day. Yeah, for sure. Um, somebody says, where can one donate for a fecal transplant? Are you talking human or animal? (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, because I think you can do both. Um, well, we're, we're looking for donors. Um, feel free to send me an email. Um, (laughs) I think actually the best way is to reach my team because they are coordinating this team at animalbiome.com. We are always looking for healthy donors. It's, very much a labor of love to keep a pool of healthy donors going. So the healthy donors, uh, they would be dogs that are not on medications or just dogs that you test and their microbiome looks good. Oh yeah. No, we can't be, they have to be basically young and healthy and on any medications and not have any parasites or pathogens. And so it's, you know, there's usually a period of time when they can be a donor and then something happens or they move out of the area or, (laughs) but so we're constantly needing, um, new ones to sort of, cause you have to have high standards for something like this. Sure. Um, for the study, how soon after antibiotic treatment would probiotics delay the healing? So if somebody wanted to restart their probiotic that they, that they like, and that their dog does well on, but they, let's say they had a week of metronidazole, um, instead of restarting the probiotic right then, how long of a delay would they? I, I would delay at least a month. A month. Wow. Interesting. So here's when, when we would prescribe antibiotics in the clinic, we would automatically hand them probiotics to go home with the antibiotics. Is that good or bad? It's it's, and that's what they did in human medicine too. They've stopped doing it. In fact, now they know like it can actually, in addition to slowing the recovery after antibiotics, it can alter the outcome of chemotherapy. So like, we just didn't know we were doing exactly, you know, in the past. So it's a big field with a lot of research going on all the time. And so, you know, the advice changes as we learn. So, okay. So I'm glad I'm not in clinical practice anymore because now I'm really confused. Uh, so we always sent them home with probiotics to go with their antibiotics to help them recover from that and repopulate their gut. Um, will the gut automatically repopulate after antibiotics? Always. Um, so some individuals, so, so if you, so they only recently started studying, like what happens if you give a healthy dog antibiotics when they didn't need it and look at how long does it take for them to recover? Right. Because, 
and then how long if you give a dog that has has colitis or you know IBD or um, gastric reflux. So even among healthy dogs, they it's variable. Some of them don't. Some percentage of them don't recover even after like ninety days. Um, so and what they found, at least with the human research, and I'm pretty sure there's mouse model work that supports this, is that giving probiotics will actually delay that recovery even longer. So because the promise, that, so in the future, we're going to have probiotics that have the right microbes in it, but right now we only have FMT. So really what you want to do is do FMT because you want to give back the right, the beneficial anaerobes and not these food associated like lactobacillus and sort of cheese and yogurt bacteria. So veterinarians, instead of stocking probiotics to send home with antibiotics, should be stocking uh, FMT. Yeah, or they could do their own, you know, I mean, like there are veterinarians who have their own donors and do that. I mean, in the future, hopefully we're going to get these things in culture and we don't have to have live donors. Wow. Okay. You just blew the minds of a lot of veterinarians. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is why it's uh, taking time for, for, but yeah, hopefully we'll be able to have these new tools. But right now, FMT is a good way to go. Okay. So we're doing round three of gut restore for my raw fed dog, the second being from conventionally fed dogs. It seems there have been wild sp swings in the microbiota. When does one take a break if things are clinically great? Oh yeah, if things are clinically fine, I think you can take a break. Um, yeah, but um, it is true like when, when you make a, a big diet change or when you reintroduce microbes with FMT, like the community can swing around a lot and it can take time to settle down. And I think it depends a lot on the specifics of what's going on inside your pet. But um, normally it's it's within about 30 days, but it can be longer. Sounds like it's been longer here. Yeah. Uh, what can be given for loose poo instead of metronidazole? Well, I have a Chinese herb that works great and I've got clinical studies to back it up and she's got a fecal transplant capsule that you can use instead. <laughs> yes, or actually S. Pilardii works just fine and there's like more than a thousand papers supporting its use for that and it significantly uh, reduces diarrhea and, um, and, um, and it doesn't harm. Well, we know from doing all FMTs is that you can do Espelardii along with the FMT and it doesn't harm the ability of the native bacteria to colonize. So it can control the diarrhea while you're doing the FMT. So I can do it. I would like doing them hand in hand, but I would love to learn about this herb. Great Sauceria coptis. Um, I, I have to send you the, I just sent the paper to somebody else um, at the hospital the other day, but I, I can send it to you. I'll just have to remind, you might have to remind me. Okay. Um, yes, please. All right. If we have a healthy dog, is it harmful to give probiotics if we're rotating products or better not to give any? So many vets and animal professionals recommend probiotics. Well, I mean, I think they can be good for like a food transition, right? Like I think it's just, I, I like to keep them on the shelf. And if like there's a flare up of diarrhea or something, I just give it. But then if I only do it. You can do it for a day or two. You don't have to do it for a whole course. I think we get locked into thinking 30 days, but um, I would just use them as needed unless you need them for stability, right? Like sometimes that's what's required. Yeah. I mean, there are some cases where the animals, we get them on a probiotic and their skin is clearing up and, you know, their guts are clearing up and, uh, you know, it just seems like they just need that extra boost. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, part of it is that, so some um, individuals, like their immune system is actually targeting the healthy microbes in the gut. And so you, you have to keep introducing them. And I think probiotics are especially important for those individuals who can't support the, the healthy community. Okay. Otherwise. Great. Great, great. Um, all right. We don't only have like two minutes, so I'm going to see if there's anything. If there's like 160 new messages down below this. Oh, I talk too much. <laughs> I don't know. This is great. What, is, what does something like Thailand powder do to the microbiome? Um, actually, yeah. So this is, um, we have a study going on right now. We're looking at, so um, Tylosin is being used in, in Europe instead of metronidazole because metronidazole is an important antibiotic for humans. So because resistance is spreading for it, they've, they've outlawed it in, for veterinary medicine. And so they use Tylosin. Um, the relapse rate for both, for diarrhea cases, um, for both of those um, antibiotics is, is very high between like 85 and 100%. 
Um, what does it do? I think maybe Dr. Morgan can answer the specifics of its mode of action probably better than I can. Um, I'd have to ask our chief veterinarian, although she's told me before. I, <laughs> yeah. I never used Thailand in my practice. Um, uh, I think people do find it useful. What we're studying is whether or not you can follow, this is more in conventional practice, if you can follow a course of, um, of Thailand with a fecal transplant and reduce the relapse rate so that they might not have to keep going on through these, because basically they end up on this medical merry-go-round with it, as well as with sure. metronidazole. Yeah, well. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's it's another IBD treatment, um, but again, we're putting a Band-Aid on, we're not solving the underlying problem, which is probably a food uh, intolerance that we need to change the diet, and, um, you know, this, things that are out of balance and also the microbiome is a mess and the Thailand isn't helping the microbiome. It's, it's, I think making it worse. So, um, all right. Do, 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 do. Yeah. I, there's, there's somebody that gives ginger ta tablets, grating fresh ginger in the evening meal. That's awesome. Um, our banana is a good source of fiber. I think they are. What do you think? I think they're fine. Yeah. Uh, how do we set up our older puppies for a life of good gut health? Feed real food. Don't over vaccinate. Avoid chemicals as much as possible that are going to change the microbiome. Anything else? Yeah. Right. Reduce, you know, try to reduce use of medications as much as possible. I, I do recommend testing ahead of time. Make sure that they do have the right microbes to begin with. Right. And that they're responding to the diet like as you would like. Yep. Okay. Uh, so we are at the end of our hour. Can ginger work as fast as metronidazole? Um, sometimes my dog has to. Well, so the ginger I use more for the reflux and the upper GI stuff. Um, lower GI stuff. Again, I've got this herb, Coptis. It's actually on my website. Uh, that's what I do for the lower bowel stuff. But like I said, the, like the one that was saying the frustrated dog that, that, you know, the dog gets all worked up and then we've got diarrhea that goes along with that. That's the, the liver cheese stagnation overacting on the digestive system. And that's a different herb. It's free and easy wanderer. Uh, those are on the website and there are explanations mm -hmm. under them for, uh, what they would be used for. But, um, <laughs> You know, it's a whole Chinese medicine lecture. We'll have to do another one on that. But a wood personality dog, which is those ones that get really cranky and that, you know, like they don't like to be told what to do and then they get cranky at you. Um, uh, we can see it in, in uh, German Shepherds. We see it in Yorkies, you know, because they're, they're like, they're little, but they're tough. And they're like, I'll tell you what to do. <laughs> so that's, uh, we get a lot of liver cheese stagnation. And if you have a working dog that uh, is not working, and you don't give them an outlet for that frustration, you will get the same types of problems. You will start to get breakthrough diarrheas with these guys because they're frustrated um, and, and they, they just need a job. So get them a job. Uh, Holly, you're amazing. Uh, what you're doing is amazing. Um, and you have really just thrown uh, a monkey wrench into what a lot of people are doing. And they're all kind of going, holy crap, now I don't know what to do. This whole weekend has been a weekend of, Oh my God, now I don't know what to do because <laughs> there's so much new information, but we appreciate it uh, because we keep learning. Um, so for those of you who have been watching, we do have a link to Animal Biome in our uh, web store on drjudymorgan.com. So there is a link in there. Um, and I'll try to remember to have Gwen include that link for you when she sends you out the email later this week that has all of the videos for you to download and rewatch and uh, take more notes and get more confused. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it won't be that bad. Um, and uh, we also will give you websites and contact information uh, if you have more questions about one of the, you know, individual videos. Um, 
so that you can reach out to the people behind them, um, like Animal Biome uh, or Dr. Tobias or whatever. So uh, thank you, Holly, for being here. Thank you, all of you who have uh, stuck with us for the long weekend. We really appreciate it. Um, and uh, we'll hold another summit, usually about every six months. And we're open to suggestions for people that you would like to see interviewed or hear information from. So you can send us uh, what you would like to hear as well. Um, they're fun. I always learn a lot. And now my head is spinning as well. <laughs> okay. Holly, you are in charge because I made you the host. So you get to end the meeting for all. And I will end with a farewell and thanks to everyone. Holly, you're great. Oh, you're great. And thank you everyone for, for taking the time to, to listen today. Bye. Have a great rest of the weekend. Bye. <laughs>